none of it is um, anything that is uh, spe has specifically um, has anything that is um, difficult to watch, I would say, but it, I know it's a very sensitive topic, so I just wanted to say that. Um, okay, so. So, it all started with this video that I saw by chance um, after a day of sifting through video archives shot by Palestinians in the occupied territories. And um, this video is filmed by a Palestinian filmmaker, Zidane Sharbadi. And across from Zidane is an Israeli religious settler in her 30s or 40s. And Zidane and this, um, and this uh, Jewish settler um, are locked in a recorded checkmate. And I think it's interesting that um, you can't see it well because the lights are on here, but the camera is sort of like this black bar preserving the anonymity of this Israeli woman who's also behind a camera. And they're locked in a recorded checkmate. And this image took hold of me strongly, this first image that I found. And I began to find more and more like it. So more images where, um, where Israelis and Palestinians were, were filming each other. So they were sort of almost waiting for each other, um, faced off against each other in a direct tension of visioning. And I wondered, what was each hoping that these images would prove? Who would look away first? And what would be the impact of this surveillance and of this simultaneous counter surveillance? I found these images I found these images in the B'Tselem video archives in a small office building in West Jerusalem, not far from where my grandmother lives. And um, these images are from a, a project um, from B'Tselem, which is an Israeli NGO um, that began a ca distributing cameras to Palestinians living in the West Bank and East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, so areas where tensions are high and clashes are commonplace. And they started this project in 2007, and just as a reference, that's about three years before the Arab Spring. And they have an archive of about 5,000 hours of footage. And I started this project because I don't understand the conflict emotionally or intellectually. Um, I am an Israeli citizen, and so I'm forbidden legally from entering Palestinian-controlled cities like Ramallah, Janine, Bethlehem. Um, and I wanted to see material and footage that was from a perspective that was not my own and not one that I can easily get from um, the Israeli news media. I also started this project because of one distinct characteristic about this conflict, and that is that um, Israeli law is more lenient on recording than the state of Massachusetts is. So um, the filmmakers who film with B'Tselem, like Raid Abu Armiela here, who I met in Hebron, they sign an explicit legal document with the Israeli army. And they wear badges around their necks, like you can see with Raid here, um, almost like they were attending a conference, but this is a badge that the Israeli army recognizes them as filmmakers. So the original intent of B'Tselem was to empower Palestinians with cameras against their Israeli counterparts who have guns. And both can then shoot, right? You can shoot with a camera, you can shoot with a gun. But in these clips, both parties actually turn towards their cameras. And this is what I call shooting back at shooting back, this camera versus camera. So a Palestinian records a demolition site. A citizen videotape records a, pal a policeman and uploads it to YouTube. And a satellite looks on. We live in a society that records and observes. And what are we to make of this surveillance and this simultaneous echoing counter surveillance? This impulse to fight cameras with cameras didn't start all at once, and when I began to thinking about this impulse, I wanted to trace it and to use the B'Tselem archives as a sort of case study. Um, and so I, I started to collect where it began. And um, I think one of the places it begins is the mere acknowledgement of the camera by smiling or posing even, right, as you saw in that last clip. 
So the promise of surveillance changes that which is surveilled. That is the observer effect writ large. So often the camera is ignored and it's notable when its presence begins to be acknowledged. The second way station is the ghosting arm gesture of the camera, right? So those are two young Israeli boys in a settlement that are making fun of how the cameraman was holding his camera. And in an earlier clip, this is a B'Tselem training session, training Palestinian boys how to hold their cameras. Um, I saw a, a training person um, teaching a Palestinian boy how to do the quote T-Rex, where you tuck your elbows close into your side for stability and hold your arm up over the camera body. And when I think about this, I think about how um, all of the footage in this archive is, is tripod free, right? It's shaky, it's unstable, it's, it's, it's not clear. But a clear and rich image is what claims power with its clarity. And, and clear, rich images claim power and subvert dominance. And here I'm, I'm thinking a lot about Hito Sherrill's um, essay in defense of the poor image and how oftentimes poor images, are when they're circulated, they have a wider spread, um, but that spread kind of comes into con conflict with the richness of a clear image. And the second way station I found was the wet lens and the blind lens. So in this clip, I saw a young Israeli on the street from behind a grate. He displays a, a bottle of Coca-Cola and flings it at the lens, a direct hit. And then there were many clips where young Israeli settlers figured out they could fight the lens with mirrors and the sun. And when I found these clips, they melted me. The way in which um, when, the, when the camera receives the direct light, um, it blinds the camera. And I was interested in these um, because this fight with the lens is aphysical, right? So all of this filming is legal. So a person, when they want to fight the camera, they can't physically go take the camera and crash it or, or, or obstruct it. And so this was a way to obstruct the camera at a distance, just with the mere physics of the camera. And there's a bigger picture here because this conflict is as much one of media and metadata as it is one of physical borders, boundaries, and wars. We've long known that this is a media war, as is such for many conflicts, right? With the Arab Spring and the Twitter uprisings to the Black Lives Matter movement and the push to arm police with body cams and the push for citizen video archives and ACLU apps and many kind of ways to kind of um, give uh, legitimacy to citizen videography. And I think what is new in this archive, in what I call shooting back at shooting back, is that we get to see the exact moment when a physical conflict moves into a media conflict. And the liminal state change is the camera itself. And when cameras face off against other cameras, we witness the fight to intervene on the state change from physical data to metadata. And we witness the state change in media res. And we will also witness the attempt to block that state change, right? Often soldiers in the B'Tselem video archives would take out their phones because they cannot block the lens with their hand because this filming is legal. So without that option, they choose to block the camera with another camera as a physical obstruction. Shooting back is of course a way to claim power and fighting this power looks like an elaborate choreographed dance. In this clip, I see them moving in duets, as if marking out an elaborate waltz that only they know. It's an angry waltz, a frustrated one, and it's one that's fear with, full of fear and indignancy and past wounds, and also boredom and sadness. And when they change partners in filming back at filming back, the partners change, but the feelings persist. 
And in this waltz, I feel the gravitas that perhaps what I call the civil contract of videography is a complete fallacy. And that civil contract of videography is the idea that if you just capture injustice on film, it will be remedied. Um, so that civil contract of videography is extended from a term from Ariella Azule, who's at Brown, which is the civil contract of photography, which is this idea that um, if you capture an injustice on photography, it'll be remedied, right? And so that we know that doesn't work, right? It used to be the case that in this country, um, images of lynchings would be circulated as celebrations. And now they're not, but the images have stayed the same and it's society that has changed. And so we come to the last clip I will show you, which I call the next echo. And in this clip, soldiers enter a house in Hebron, and it's a night search. And they find a hard drive. And what's, they ask, what's on here? And so the father in this house takes out a Toshiba laptop, which you'll see in a moment. Yeah. And um, to sort of jump ahead and let you know what they're about to find, you'll see it as the clip unfolds. What they find on the hard drive is all of the videos that this father has filmed for the B'Tselem video archives. And I almost feel as if everything should explode in paradox at this moment, right? So what we have is a camera filming soldiers who are looking at footage of past soldiers that have been filmed. And it's almost, this is what we have here in Shooting Back at Shooting Back. We have this complete paradox where um, more cameras in a situation doesn't necessarily cause justice to be remedied. And so I think that's where I'd like to leave you is with this question of, is it just that in the end, adding more cameras causes the change or does something else need to be added to the situation? Thank you. Okay, so um, today Ben and I will discuss uh, the power of images, the power of their presence and their absence. Um, in thinking about images as a sociologist, I often wonder what do they do? I'm particularly interested in their function with the society and their impact on our social relations. Images provide us with information and help us to share information with one another. Particularly relevant to this discussion is uh, the emotions that uh, images invoke. I speak of emotions within the black feminist tradition that recognizes that emotion is very much connected with intellect and that emotions can um, have great potential in nurturing valuable critique. Situating the function of images within philosophies of perception and the nature of being, in this case being through images, they can serve as representations and interpretations of things in the world that exist. They can bring meaning in life to things that don't exist or that exist in our imaginations. So images can be powerful in this regard. Within the context of black death, images are present testimonials to lives that no longer exist, at least in the same realm as the image. They can serve 
uh, the function of preservation of a moment. So a few questions uh, we'd like you to consider today. Uh, what does black death look like? And how does capitalism shape how those images are perceived and how they are consumed? Of particular interest is what happens when images are produced in an environment that, that views black death as a commodity, where there's a market for black death. What then becomes the function of these images? One could argue that there is and has always been a market for black death. Black death as commodity is fueled by anti-blackness, which is the dehumanization of black people, the belief that something is inherently wrong with black people. And the media, particularly news outlets, but not exclu exclusively, use black death within capitalist contexts as commodity to sell to consumers. That there is a literal consumption of black death, where we trade death for clicks. What are the implications of these decisions about how these images are organized, curated, distributed, repeated? For me, and for others like me, a major consequence is trauma. Initial trauma from contact with images of black death as reminders of my own mortality and the mortality of my loved ones, unwarranted, unnatural mortality at the hands of the state is one example. Subsequent trauma from repeated exposure to these images and the ritualistic dehumanization, victim blaming, judgment, and eventual erasure that comes with them. Many of my experiences with suffering on social media platforms like Facebook have been through exposure to trauma as image. I also consider the trauma inflicted by others who deny the humanity of black folks as we collectively engage the same image, thus rendering our or black folks humanity invisible. For example, images and videos on Facebook of someone being shot dead and seeing comments like, we don't know all the facts, uh, black people commit more crimes, and even more overtly racist comments like, they should have killed more of them are examples of how trauma invoked by an image can be exacerbated with the communal experience. And it's difficult for me to even have a discussion about images without re-triggering myself or potentially causing harm to others. Even my decisioning process for this presentation about whether or not to show images and which images uh, was shaped by the potential of these uh, repeated and familiar images of black death to traumatize and re-traumatize. So this serves as a reminder of how uh, we're also impacted not just by the images, but by their echoes. And what I mean by echo is the frequency of the images repeated on our news feeds, not just the initial image, but the repeated and specifically non-consensual exposure to these images. And echoes become more faint with time, illustrating the subtle process of erasure that takes place with repeated exposure. So what are the consequences for black people who experience trauma from these images? And what does it mean for those who misrecognize black people's humanity when they take in these images? So take the first question. I'm reminded of the recent research related to generational trauma, how we're finding that trauma can be expressed and transferred through DNA. Now think about the compounding implications for a moment of black people experiencing generational trauma that is expressed and transferred through DNA over the course of generations, and then to have that trauma triggered, perhaps through metabolic memory, when exposed to images of black death or general black harm. That the trauma experienced by Annie Gooch, my last known relative to have lived as an enslaved person, a black woman, might somehow run through me, speaks directly to the potential implications of images. What trauma is triggered on a metabolic and metaphysical level when I see images of a 12-year-old black boy being gunned down in a park by cops from their car within three seconds of arriving on the scene? or when I see images of black girls being violently body slammed in school or pinned down on the concrete while in their bathing suits? What happens when ancestral traumas are thrown into conversation with more current traumas? Or when current images of black death are thrown in conversation with one another? And what do others see? What of those who took pleasure in the consumption of black death during Annie Gucci's time and now? What is the function of the image then? How do these images serve to maintain systems of oppression and power structures whose foundational premise is invested in black people's dehumanization and annihilation? I have found these images blending together as they are committed to memory and perhaps added to the metabolic and metaphysical fabric of my existence. The guilt that comes with the brain's inability to detect and distinguish between images and names, times and locations, the overwhelming burden of holding so many images in my mind and heart and recognizing their humanity as the political and cultural environment around us attempts to strip them of it, commodifying it through quantification, number of views, number of comments, number of reactions, number of videos, number of bodies. 
So what do we do? How do we respond in a way that asserts our agency um, as we're being imposed upon? So I want to pick up this question of agency uh, by thinking about what we see in our newsfeed in the first place. And, a, and unfortunately, a good example for thinking about that is uh, the recent election. Um, many people were surprised, I think, by the election results. I know I was, even though I'm someone who focuses on Facebook and how the newsfeed algorithm works and all these kinds of things. Yet at the same time, um, uh, you know, I was expecting Clinton to win. And, and I think one of the reasons that I was expecting that was because the world as I saw it through the Facebook newsfeed suggested that. Um, but this is an example of how algorithmic feeds show us the world it thinks we want to see, not the world that we necessarily have. But how the newsfeed algorithm determines want uh, is based largely off of what we react to. Uh, this is because Facebook's goal isn't to keep users informed uh, or to be conscious of appropriation or potential trauma. Facebook's goal is to keep users engaged. In other words, their motive is profit, not democracy. So any image that produces a reaction, whether it's happy or sad, angry or wow, is a good one as far as Facebook's profit motive is concerned because it keeps users clicking. Um, and they don't care how distressing that image might be. They might talk about it a little bit, but mostly it produces more cash. Uh, and so this is what got Nicole and I talking, um, uh, because after the election, I'm, I'm, as, an, as an artist, I'm somebody who often when something I'm thinking about any way in which software played a role in the world, I make some kind of artwork that relates to it. Um, and my artwork is usually code-based. Uh, and so I made this net artwork that I call uh, textbook. And it's a simple concept. Uh, it's a browser extension you can install. Uh, it's free and open source and just removes all images from the Facebook newsfeed, actually from the entire Facebook interface. Um, after the election, I was wondering, the reason I made it, I was just wondering, you know, what was the role that images were playing in the way that we read um, the newsfeed, uh, how we read the Facebook site in general? And I, I wanted a tool to enable myself and others to just try Facebook without the images and see what it looked like. And so within the context of our talk today, one of those new ways is a feed uh, without a constant stream of images of Black Death, as Nicole's uh, talked about. Um, and, and hiding those images has a, at least a couple of immediate effects. Um, first, removing them can blunt the emotional reaction they, they were producing for the people who saw them. In other words, the user won't be so driven by an emotional reaction or a visceral kind of you know, reaction to the images. Second, since textbook still leaves the text discussion, links, and all that information still in place, it does potentially uh, enable an increased critical reflection on everything that's left. In other words, you're not you know, instantly just reacting to the image so you can see what the text says and you can think about what the discussion is and this kind of a thing. Over time, these changes should accumulate to produce wider effects. Uh, for example, a user's newsfeed may show less of these images over time. This is because the user won't appear to desire such images in the first place uh, or in the same way uh, since they aren't reacting to them like they were before. And since users aren't reacting in the same way, those images become less profitable for those who posted them, uh, as well as Facebook itself. In, in other words, by hiding images of black deaths, such images are no longer commodified in the same way. And of course, Facebook isn't the only place that such images are commodified. Um, a current example is going on right now at the Whitney Museum. I don't know how many people might have seen the, the biennial um, exhibition, which is going on right now, um, where a white artist named Dana Schutz painted or repainted a photo of Emmett Till in his casket from 1955 um, and showed the painting as part of this prestigious exhibition. But starting on the opening day of that exhibition, um, artist Parker Bright wrote Black Death Spectacle on the back of his t-shirt and stood in front of the painting for several hours a day trying to block people's view of it. 
um, and also engaging people in conversation and talking about it. Um, while he wasn't able to permanently hide the painting, he was encouraging critique of the painting's appearance in the show, and as he said, to the problem of a white artist and a major museum profiting from an image of black death. And so, just as Bright chose to disrupt the visibility of that painting by standing in front of it, we're proposing a not dissimilar disruption on Facebook. And that's just hiding images. Um, the point is that as long as so much of our information comes through these corporate profit-making closed wall systems, it's important to not just take them as is, uh, but to treat a system like Facebook as recomposable material rather than as a fixed site of consumption. Uh, in other words, text textbook gives users new agency to be more deliberate in what they consume, enables more criticality of the text that's left, hopefully calms some of the trauma that such images can produce and, and disrupts the corporate machines that profit by making black death both, both visible and, and invisible at the same time. That's it. Thanks. Hey, I'm Roshan. Thanks for waiting, everyone. That was really nice of you. Um, so I'm a journalist. I cover urban policy, uh, mostly around New York. I, I, uh, I did a few stories on Airbnb uh, a few months ago um, regarding some of their like, issues with race, and I kind of just wanted to share um, what I learned and some of the things I was thinking about, um, about the uh, limitations of uh, Airbnb and other startups uh, in terms of how they... Uh, deal with race. Um, so, this close? A little less close? Okay. Is everyone good? Okay. Thanks. You raised your hand. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the first thing I want to talk about is um, the problems with creating. Uh, a website that isn't racist, which is something that um, I came across when I was uh, reporting on a story on Airbnb. Uh, so I think most people uh, know that Airbnb has been subject to a lot of public criticism uh, regarding racial discrimination that often happens on the site. Um, there was a hashtag called uh, Airbnb while black, uh, where people discriminate, um, highlighted discrimination. These are some of the recent ones. Uh, it was more popular last summer, but I was surprised to see that it's like still frequently uh, being used for people to complain about discrimination on the site. Um, more recently, over President's Day weekend, um, an Asian American uh, woman in Southern California was denied a place to stay. And uh, the response uh, from the person who denied her place to stay was one word says it all, uh, Asian. And then he went on to cite um, Donald Trump as uh, one of the reasons he didn't want to give her a place to stay. Um, I think we can all agree that's bad. Uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> um, so I think some of the ways that uh, Airbnb and uh, other companies that sprung up 
um, to compete with Airbnb, try to deal with this problem, um, were really instructive and kind of like interesting to me in terms of like people trying to figure out a way to develop a website that isn't um, racist and there, there wasn't like a lot of like clear agreement on how that would work. Um, so there were two uh, competing websites that came out around the same time. One was called Noir BNB, one was called, uh, they were actually both called Noir BNB at first when they first came out. One had an E at the end and they were both, um, uh, both of them were like uh, appearing in the same articles and getting the same press around the same time, which was kind of weird because then it was like, what, like, do they know each other? This is really weird. So like, because I was wondering that, like I called them both and I was like, do you guys know each other? This is really weird. And then they were both like, yeah, like we know each other. And, and we like uh, thought about uh, linking up as, um, you know, one website because we thought it was weird that there was like two different websites with the same name. Um, and then what I found out is, uh, first of all, th that the owners of each of these websites had, um, I guess they didn't like each other. I don't want to uh, gossip too much, but, um, you know, they, they uh, I talked to them for a long time. Um, but <laughs> um, the other thing is that there was a philosophical disagreement between um, the, the founders of both of these websites about um, how... Uh, how you would make a website that uh, limits discrimination. Um, so the philosophical disagreement comes down to um, there was a, a, a Harvard study um, put forth by two researchers in 2014. <clears throat> um, they found that if you were a black guest on uh, Airbnb, you had 16% less chance of getting a room than a white guest. And so they put forward a bunch of recommendations, and one of those recommendations was you should remove uh, name, identifying information, photos altogether from the website. Um, so that was one of their, you know, that was one of their like chief uh, recommendations. Um, <clears throat> so, so one of these websites uh, thought that was a really good idea. And the other one thought that was like a really uh, bad idea. So um, let me try to remember. So inclusive, uh, they went with the Harvard researchers, uh, and they said that uh, you know basically if you want to make a website that's competing with Airbnb for um, customers of color, we have to go with what these Harvard researchers say and we have to just like remove your photo and identifying information and there's like, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Like, of course we should do that. And then I, um, I talked to uh, the founder of NorBnB and he's like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you make a website for like people of color that's like a community where people are like, oh yeah, we just wanna like have, have more of like a friendly, smaller, more community oriented version of Airbnb, but you can't see their face. Like that doesn't make any sense. Um, so, let me see. So, so there's kind of a trade-off um, between those two approaches. Um, when I interviewed a lot of people just to like see, like, get a sense of, of, of you know, people of color who are using Airbnb, like w what they would prefer. Um, no person of color I spoke to said that they'd be more comfortable without seeing the host's identity. Um, there was a mixed reaction regarding the suggestion of using a two-way mirror approach where the guest's identity is hidden, but you can see the host's identity. Um, I think the trade-off is that, obviously, if you can see someone's photo, um, it opens you up to racial discrimination. But on the flip side, um, from people I spoke to, it, um, it also creates a buffer preventing a potentially awkward or dangerous experience for a person of color who will be uh, living in the same home as possibly a racist. That would be really awkward. I think all agree. All right. um, so, so Airbnb didn't... By the way, that's me using one of those websites and um, it has a, has a nice suggestion. You should upload your photo for people to see and um, that's me eating udon noodles. Um, I don't know. I just figured I would show that to you. Um, so Airbnb did not take 
the uh, the they didn't integrate the Harvard researchers' suggestion. The reason that they gave was Airbnb is a is a community, and when you use Airbnb, you want to get to know the person and the neighborhood. Um, I buy this solution, or I buy this answer coming from one of the smaller. Uh, websites that I just mentioned, or Airbnb or Inclusive, because they are trying to build a community. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that Airbnb in reality is not a personal experience anymore where you're sharing someone's home. It's often an impersonal experience where a stranger is renting out an entire apartment and only communicating with you via text, and sometimes they give you a lockbox code, and uh, sometimes there's an outside concierge that they privately hire to give you amenities and it's it's a completely like unfriendly not communal experience but Airbnb relied on the argument of community uh, they didn't want to admit how um, impersonal and unfriendly the process is and uh, they didn't want to admit that guests often don't meet hosts uh, particularly when hosts are renting out entire apartments um, whether photos should be mandated on home sharing sites depends on how people use the service. If Airbnb is for sharing and community, as the, as the company suggests, it would make sense to keep the photos uh, in the booking process. But Airbnb is worth $30 billion, has 100 million users worldwide, and racks up 500,000 nightly stays. And the allure for many guests is cheap lodging, not social interaction. Um, so one more point I want to make um, oh, so this is another uh, interesting thing that was a result of Airbnb um, keeping the photos in was they, they put out data saying, you know, they did a whole like PR lobbying push after the Airbnb while black um, incident. And they put out data saying, you know, in these uh, predominantly black neighborhoods in New York City um, that people... Uh, are making a lot of money, so we're like helping, you know, black people in New York City. So um, a uh, a watchdog website um, went through the data and found that 59% of the people in those neighborhoods who were making a lot of money um, were actually white people. Um, and the way he did that was by using the photos um, that. Uh, Airbnb decided to leave up on their website, and he had a facial recognition software, and uh, by doing that was able to come to this conclusion. Um, I had more stuff. I just want to show you this tweet I really like. This is Sarah Jung. Um, and I think this uh, this point like really crystallizes some of the problems with startups to me, but um, I think this also applies to the way that Airbnb and other startups um, get around um, perfectly fine pre-existing federal regulations and protections that um, protect marginalized people or people of color. Uh, this is a uh, arbitration clause that Airbnb and lots of startup companies make you sign so that you can't file a class action lawsuit. Um, this would not be the case if you were uh, using a real bed and breakfast or a hotel. Um, and these are, uh, th these are parts of uh, Airbnb's new experience um, where they uh, let you do stuff with human beings, I guess. And um, almost all of them are uh, in New York City. All, almost all the New York City ones uh, feature black uh, and Latino community members. And um, to me, this is part of a pact that Airbnb is making with its users to promise uh, an entrepreneurial so-called uh, experience for people who are being displaced and having less federal protections. Thank you.
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mariella. Thank you for being here and thank you for having me. Um, I just want to say a couple of quick contextualizing things. Um, the first thing is that I do want to issue a trigger and content warning for my presentation. Um, the things that you should look out for are police violence, court proceedings, uh, racism, and sexism. Um, and I also want to let you know that my background is I'm, I was born in Argentina and then my family immigrated to Canada. My academic background is in philosophy and political science and I'm currently doing my master's in sociology at Queen's University. There's a little bit more about the projects that I'm working on in my bio on the website. Um, so if you want to check that out and talk to me about it later, that would be awesome. Um, Another thing that I want to do is issue a land acknowledgement. Um, I wish to acknowledge the native land on which we are gathered here today. The state of New York and the area surrounding the Museum of the Moving Image is traditional Iroquois and Six Nations territory, of which is part of 12 nations and tribes of the area, amongst many others which make up the whole of North America, traditionally known as Turtle Island. I want to begin by telling a story. This is a story that I made up. I think stories are a really important way to learn and the way that we use technology to help, pieces, to help piece together stories and fill gaps about the truth is what I'm going to be talking about today. So please, imagine the following. You have been escorted to a police station for questioning regarding your whereabouts on a particular night when a crime was committed. You are led around a corner into a wing of the station that seems full of offices and rooms with frosted glass doors. You step into the, into the room and see a metal table between two cushioned wooden chairs. There is a large mirror on one of the walls. The lighting is fluorescent, but not stark. You approach the chair nearest to you, and before the officer closes the door behind you, they ask if you would like anything to drink. You request a glass of water. The officer motions to someone outside, they close the door, and they begin explaining the way the questioning session will go. They tell you that the mirror in the room is two-way, that there's a camera in three out of the four corners of the room, and that everything that will be discussed there will be recorded for the case file. As I mention each piece of the room, you look around to acknowledge your surroundings. You receive your glass of water, the officer clears their throat, and they ask you the first question. My talk today will discuss the ethics of surveillance and security in police confession techniques and technologies. The motivation behind this search is fundamentally about human rights and authority. There is good reason to believe that not every, every suspect is treated equally, and we can use the investigations about surveillance and safety to find out why. I'll start by helping to get us all on the same page regarding what we should be aware of and what we should be looking for when we were trying to be critical about surveillance and this technology. That was the point of the story at the beginning. Um, then I'm going to be referring to four cases which you can see on the handout if you received one or up on the screen. Um, and basically these cases are going to help point out what surveillance is doing wrong. In looking at those cases, I think it's important to consider the concept of protection, like whom or what is being protected, and more importantly, why. Try to think about the things that could go wrong in surveillance footage and how it's in our power to use the technology we put in place with law enforcement and protection agencies to do exactly that, enforce protection. I'll try to finish off by adding a few notes about modifications we can make to pre-existence pre-existing surveillance technology that can potentially solve a few of these problems. So we know that most surveillance technology is used for interrogations and questioning of persons in custody is based on some or a combination of photography, video, two-way mirror, audio recordings, and written statements. Outside of traditional interrogation environments, we have seen the recent developments in other technologies for recording evidence, such as body cams, or like in the other presentations that we heard of. What matters next is where this equipment is used. Cameras may be set up in plain sight, such as on a tripod, like in the back of the room, or a microphone, like the one I'm talking into, or a recorder on the table, like there's one right here. But in other instances of surveillance equipment may be hidden. Two-way mirrors are sometimes inconspicuous, and for those without the knowledge of what two-way mirrors can look like or how to identify them, while looking at similar regular mirrors and that have a reflective surface, um, they can view, be viewed through from the other side. One may not be aware of cameras hidden in the corners of the room, or even without the knowledge of what they look like, may be convinced that there may be like alarms or PA systems or something like that. It's uh, one of these initial points of ethical treatment to make the suspect aware and conscious of the fact that they're being recorded in a questioning situation. Consider the angles and positioning of the surveillance equipment. That's what these pictures are for. Um, are the cameras forward facing? Are they capturing only the suspect in the frame or is the detective included? Is there a full scope of the entire room? If individuals are sitting, is their entire composure being captured or only above the waist or the neck? 
When we view this visual footage of all of these details, they can give us a large amount of information about behavior psychology as well as accountability for body contact. Perhaps most controversially, Toronto police officers who wear body cams have the autonomy to choose when they activate recording. What can these variables and conscious decisions tell us about autonomy and accountability? Regardless of whether they're being protected by or protected against, these details are choices that humans make and how they affect others matters. There are reasons why in some cases, suspects are not made aware of the ways in which they're surveilled or being questioned. I'm gonna talk about one of those examples a little bit later. Now I want to direct you to those vid videos examples. I found all of these videos for free on YouTube, so if you're interested, you can watch them all. They're available to you, and you can make your own assessments and criticism, which I encourage you to do. The reason why I'm including the names and a little bit of details about these cases is that because they're pretty old, all these cases have been solved, and they're closed. So the first example that I want to talk about is um, focusing on a man named Russell Williams. In this interrogation video, that's the top video right over there. In this interrogation video spanning almost three hours, we see Williams, white male, and Detective Smith, white male, enter a room where there is a metal table against a wall and two small office chairs. Williams places his jackets on the back of the chair and they're making small talk. There's a black portfolio and some miscellaneous items on the table already there when they arrive. When the, within the first 27 seconds of the video, the detective points out the three cameras in the room. There are three camera perspectives that show a close-up of where William sits, a further angle of the detective, and an all-encompassing angle where they're both seen, their distance from each other, and the items on, the, on top of the table in the room. There's also a microphone on the table. Williams acknowledges them and looks around the room. Detective Smith sits back in the chair and begins explaining the severity of the case, along with an explanation of the steps the, inve the investigation has taken. There's a calm demeanor between both men, and Williams is given ample time in silence without disruption to provide his answers. The second example is focused on a man at this point named uh, Brendan Dassey. That's that video right there. This interrogation tape, timed at under one hour, depicts Dassey, white male, a minor at the time, escorted into a room. A camera is already rolling. He sits in a small two-seater couch and is left alone for a few moments, after which two officers, two white males, return. One of the officers asks Dassey if he would like a soda or a water. Dassey requests water. He can, we cannot see the officer's faces because the camera is only pointed towards the couch at sitting level. There are very brief moments when you make out the officer's face, like when they exit the room and look back or close the door. When they lean forward, you can see the back and the side of the head. You can see a little snippet of it in that picture there or in your handout. At 0039, the time marker 39 seconds, Dassey looks at the wall closest to him and sits up slightly as if to check for something. It's off frame, but we can speculate that it could be a camera or a microphone. Something just looks a little off. It seems that the audio is being recorded from the same camera that the tape is coming from. We know the room Dassey is held in is not soundproof because we can hear mumbling and phones ringing outside of the door. Dassey is left alone for a number of minutes. Officers return with his water and they advise that they will turn, turn off alternate audio because the room is already being recorded. Um, the officer casually reminds Dassey of his Miranda rights and they verbally confirm that Dassey still wants to talk. Questioning follows. The third example that I want to talk about is focusing on Duran Love. That's this video up here. Local Milwaukee News covered the, ca the case of Duran Love, a black male, and Detective Rodolfo Gomez, a Hispanic male, wherein Gomez was charged for assault while Love was being held for questioning. The video shows Love handcuffed to the wall in a very small holding cell. He sits on a slightly padded chair, and his head is down in an uncuffed arm on the table. Detective Gomez stands over him. There's a piece of paper on the table. There are two camera angles, one in the upper left corner that shows the shows all of the room except for the entryway, and the second as a close-up of the corner where Love is sitting. Gomez is rapid-firing questions at Love. Love is seen slamming a fist onto the table and standing up quickly, raising his voice at the detective in denial of the accusations. Love pushes the table and he shifts forward slightly, and, the detective, and detective Gomez pushes Love with his left hand, forcing Love down into the corner chair. Detective Gomez is then seen punching Love in the face, pushing him into a sitting position on the chair, followed by restraining Love's neck and chest with his forearm. There is yelling throughout. Love is seen attempting to cover his head and face from further blows administered by the detective. The second officer requests Love to sit on the floor, after which the officers leave. 
You should remember that he's still cuffed to the wall at this point. After about two minutes, Gomez re-enters the room and immediately pins Love against the wall. The table is out of frame. Gomez is followed in by two other officers. They scramble to remain... Re they scramble to restrain Love and they uncuff him. As Love protests, Gomez is seen placing his hands and fingers forcefully onto Love's face. Love is restrained by three officers forcefully against a wall, unlocked from the cuffs and escorted out of the room. The fourth example I want to talk about is focusing Olivia Lord. That's this picture right here. Another situation in which a detective, Dwayne Thompson, black male, is charged with reckless and malicious treatment of Olivia Lord, white female, during a three hour long interrogation. The footage, so sh the footage shows Lord and Thompson in a large questioning room. Tom's face is out of frame, but sitting on the edge of the chair, um, sitting on the edge of the office chair at the end of the narrow table, we can see two cups, paper, and a clipboard. Lord is visually and audibly distraught, burrowing her face in her hands and is heard crying as Thompson le leans in closer to her, speaking loudly over her voice. He is heard yelling and cr cursing, cursing at her. Lord is heard making room making claims to which Thompson interrupts and denies repeatedly. The examples I have chosen to include describe a variety of situations and their outcomes in similar circumstances. However, it is clear that not everyone was treated equally and surveillance has helped prove that. Race and gender are vital characteristics to consider when we look back to analyze these examples. Williams and Smith had a civil, even positive interaction. Williams confessed and was found guilty. Dassey seemed to be trusting of his officers. He was coaxed into a false false confession. Love was accused of murder and was violently assaulted by, inter by his interrogation officer, um, found not guilty. Um, Lord was verbally antagonized by her interrogator and sued for which she got $1.2 million for a violation of civil rights. She was found not guilty. Surveillance tactics and technologies in police interrogations can help uncover more details about criminal activity. They can help us uncover ways in which ethics, and our ethics are violated and discrimination amongst officers of the law. To wrap up, I want to re reiterate why we should care about the ways in which these forms of th surveillance are progressed. We've been told that it's for armed protection, for terrorism, or national security threats against child pornography and other such criminal activity. So I want to implore you to ask who actually holds the power, who's being protected, from whom and by whom, and that protection should be considered a two-way street. The suspects should be protected from the officers and the officers should be protected from the subjects. So I want to also ask how else we can see surveillance. Perhaps it's not really about how we see it, but how we see through it. Where the line is drawn between the limits of helpful and harmful ways to, see, to use surveillance features. My main suggestion is to realize our limits. If we consider pairing already existing technology, that of surveillance is already established in that of motion and audio sensory technology, we, can, we may be able to give surveillance in police interrogation settings a new dimension to prevent these problems. How we do so is by coordinating the persons in a questioning room to surveillance machine, both audio and visual. We can use the cameras to track the size, height, and general whereabouts of individuals within the assigned room. If we're able to track their physical presence, especially in accordance to each other, then an alarm system could be capable of hook being hooked up to the adjacent video program to go off at any time two or more tracked bodies come within a certain distance of each other. Similarly, the audio being recorded reaches a certain decibel, say between 70 decibels, that's considered irritating, to 90 decibels, considered extremely unpleasant. An alarm can be set to alert a supervising officer that verbal abuse, for example, in the form of screaming or yelling, um, could be going off. This is, again, in efforts to protect both parties. Um, Last couple of sections. Uh, surveillance is power. That's the whole point of this. Power may fluctuate as we have contested in terms of who protects whom, but most recently in the actions of Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, and Chelsea Manning. Finally, surveillance so specially removes these human characteristics that easily set us apart from machines and so easily can set, up, set us apart from each other. These are issues we need to deal with quickly and carefully before we undermine our safety and development further and cannot easily tell the difference between who does the watching and what is to be watched. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for such great presentations. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around them, um, but I do wanna say that I have really high expectations for this conference always, and you guys surpassed it. So I really appreciate all of your insights. So with that being said, um, do any of you guys have questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I guess this is more for the first two presentations. Um, I was really kind of struck by two ideas that more cameras don't create justice and the fact that um, 
example that you brought up that these images of black death create more trauma. Um, and so I'm, I'm, my question is about the inherent tension between the production and then dissemination of these media um, and their role as evidence. I mean evidence twofold here, right? Socio-culturally speaking, in, in, in terms of it being proof that it happened and it happened as such, and then also evidence as, you know, as it's known in the legal world, right? Um, so that, as well as, you know, the fact that the wide dissemination of these media are traumatic, right? And kind of um, feed into sort of a, a racial unconscious. So how do we kind of resolve this tension? Or how do we deal with this tension? Because it is, on one hand, important, yet it's still perpetuating trauma in a lot of different ways. Um, I don't... I don't know that this is going to answer your question, <laughs> but to kind of add to the conversation, um, one of the things that I find so interesting is like this, this idea of evidence and whose claims are viewed as legitimate and under what circumstances. Um, my research is like related to none of this. It's, it's actually political consumerism. And in, a, in an attempt of going through the archives, trying to find case, trying to find instances of political consumerism, um, I could not avoid um, finding instances of police brutality within neighborhoods. This was like during the 60s and 70s, looking at welfare rights organizations. So I wasn't even looking for it. Um, and um, it was documented there. Um, the um, When I hear uh, stories about discrimination and, and, and mistreatment and those types of things, um, um, they are legitimate because um, there's a, a history that's passed down to me um, from my own experiences. So the ways in which they're legitimized, it's like, I don't need to see another video to know that this is happening. Um, but for some reason, other people do. And even when they do, it's still, but we don't know all the facts and we don't. So, so I say all that because it doesn't answer the question, but I think it adds to the to the complicated nature of white supremacy and how it works and how the, the goalpost keeps shifting. And there's a point where it doesn't matter how many videos we have, and that's what we talk about, the, the quantification, the number of videos, the number of clicks, you know, how many people need to see it before it stops. Um, so, like, so I'm with you with that tension. Um, because it doesn't have to be attention if people would just believe us. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think um, I'm trying to get at this phrase, See, I'm trying to open the phrase seeing is believing, right? Because in all of the video, in all of the video archive, um, there's this, and, and with the civil contract of videography, there's the idea if you just see it, you'll believe it, which is what you're getting at, right? This idea that if you can just see this injustice, then you'll do something about it, or you'll stop being a white supremacist, and you'll stop needing to see these videos over and over. Um, but the idea, but in reality, seeing isn't believing. That's why two sides are both filming each other, because one person is seeing with one camera, and that's, and they're filming their objective reality, objective in air quotes and the other side is filming and they're filming their quote objective reality and so um, I think seeing is believing when you add something else when you add social activism when you add training when you add social action um, and so those things happen uh, like need to happen alongside that um, and I think what I'm trying to get at is this idea oftentimes there's this idea that seeing is believing and if I can just get this piece of footage and put it somewhere like people will see and um, and in my experience in talking with with folks is that that's not how it works the ethics of sharing on Facebook. Um, it's more directed at Nicole and Ben, but um, I mean, I'm just curious about, it's a super logistical question, but if I share something about Pepsi, for example, even if I'm condemning the action and that happened, then what exactly am I contributing to? Like, am I contributing to the monetization of Pepsi itself? Like, am I increasing their share value when I do that? And at the expense of also, um, 
potentially like sharing this traumatic image. I guess I'm wondering about the logistics. Could y'all repeat her question for the live stream? Um, yeah, the question is, I'll try and summarize well, um, is, you know, what are the implications or the, the ethical implications of sharing um, uh, problematic images in a medium like Facebook um, where, you know, the, the question was about the Pepsi, recent Pepsi video um, commercial. Uh, and and you know what does it do? I mean, like you know, what what are the implications, or what does it do? And I guess I mean, thinking about it from a Facebook perspective, I mean, when it's controversial material, I think it's complicated. Um, it's not a, a, a one-sided thing, but certainly, um, you know, any any press is good press to some extent. Um, but within a, a system like Facebook, where quantification, um, metrics of visibility. Um, and any kind of reaction produces uh, uh, some some advantage in the newsfeed algorithm for everybody who might have any potential connection to anybody who might have shared it or any of these kinds of things. I think that's kind of how these things disseminate. Um, you know, I mean, I would go back to, to what I mentioned in the talk of, uh, you know, Facebook wants us to react. So the system is designed to preference reaction and reactable material. Um, to the extent that we can know, because of course it's all opaque and, and we don't really know how the newsfeed algorithm works without some attempts at reverse engineering. But um, so, I mean, the ethical implications are complicated, <laughs> I guess, is my answer. Um, that, you know, perhaps, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to read in the question a little bit. It's um, should I share the Pepsi commercial or should I not <laughs> share the Pepsi commercial? And, um, <sighs> I didn't actually even need to see the Pepsi commercial. All I needed to see was a few little bits of text about how screwed up the Pepsi commercial was to have a sense of how bad it is. Um, and then I could kind of imagine the rest. I can go look it up if I want to. But So that might be something to consider. At least it's an alternative to just you know, blanket dissemination of the thing that we're already maybe not wanting to be out there in the first place. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so, kind of my question for like is um, biometrics is kind of part of capitalism's solution for injustice, whether it's through video surveillance, body cameras, Airbnb, that these complicated technologies can solve problems, but how, how do you, um, you know, whether it's surveillance of like welfare applicants and things like that, how do you deconstruct that idea? What do you see as more um, solutions to those politics? And how do you see capitalism's investment, and actually academics' investment in quant quantity? So like quantifying, you can only prove racism, not in qualitative, because that's too emotional, but in a quantity. But how does quantifying police brutality, like I've had police officers tell me, well, it's a nationwide phenomenon. So, you know, what can you really tell our department? So biometrics, quantity, and academics, what do you see as like solutions to all of that? Uh, getting rid of all the metrics would be a good example of uh, being a good possible route. Um, anytime you track something, it starts to create uh, a desire and a need to excel within metric terms. So um, I just throw that out there as, as uh, one example. Um, would it really sort of combat what she's saying if we get rid of the metrics with people? If like sort of what Liat is talking about, we have this constant um, like, oh, I have to see it before I believe it, right? But clearly that's not the case. Um, but also on the other end too, people are so they need to see it. So there is this like balance, and I don't know that I fully agree that taking them away completely would be a good way to tackle that problem. Yeah, I think we um, disagree, but it's okay. Um, um, 
I, I think one of, one of the issues is that this um, this this myth that technology um, is objective. And I think, and I, I say this like full disclosure. So my, my partner is a computer scientist, so we have some really interesting conversations, right? Um, and I, you know, I think all computer scientists should learn black feminism, um, you know, um, as a way, yeah, uh, <laughs> um, as a way of um, um, engaging their work differently and thinking about the implications beyond the efficiencies of you know what you know what we built does it work and, and that type of thing but like the social implications of what so so I think that there's an aspect of that the the removing uh, all metrics scares me because like right now we're in a political climate where they uh, you know this regime doesn't want to they want to stop tracking housing discrimination data they want to remove um, uh, identity markers uh, LGBT LGBT status you know so they're in 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 many ways resources are attached to numbers because we still privilege quantification um, so, so I agree that there's a real problem with privileging quantification um, because it's like, what's the number? Like, how many black folks do you have to kill before it's the issue? You know what I mean? It's like, that's ridiculous. But so, so there's like multiple things going on. There's this privileging of quantification, which is an issue. Um, uh, but in the meantime, we need something to show. But I keep going back to Kimberly Crenshaw, where she says, you know, when the frame doesn't fit, the facts don't matter. So it doesn't matter how many uh, uh, studies we do and how many, you know, in academics, you know, we make careers off of people's, you know, uh, suffering and death. And um, so you, we, there, there's some things where we don't need more studies. We don't really need more information. We need to have a will to act and do something about it. Um, and whether or not folks can make that case through quantification or something else, um, as we move, I think we need to move toward that something else. But if our, if we don't care about kids getting shot, it, you know, like if we, I don't think there's much that we care about anymore beyond profit. And, and just to add to that, one question I have, I guess, for you all and for you, Roshan, is um, I get kind of depressed with this idea that we need to remove the images as a, as a solution to um, racism, like as you were talking about with the Harvard study. I mean, what, where does, or yeah, like where, where does it end? Like, should we be doing this panel behind a curtain? Um, and like, at what point does that equate to a sort of, like, a... Uh, a, a, a trying, a trying to say that everything is the same. Um, so I guess like, it's similar to the way in which we can't be overly tied towards quantification. Quantification is useful to make sure that you know yeah. we're giving social services. Like, yeah. how do we? But I, but I don't need to see somebody getting shot. Yeah, it taught definitely. Yeah, time. right, oh. right. Of course, yeah. And so there, there's a balance there. But I don't wanted to know. Yeah. Uh, so it's a really good question and this actually speaks to um, the bigger kind of like zooming out project that I'm working on for my master's which is the concept of erasure and how this lack of evidence um, is actually really detrimental to how we learn about things that have happened in the past particularly my work is focusing on the Argentinian uh, movements of the disappeared and missing and murdered indigenous women and girls of Canada and the reason why that's important is because without this kind of evidence without the uh, body cams without the security footage without the photos um, these stories are erased. They don't exist because not only is the visual not there, but the records are gone too because they've been erased on purpose. Um, that's how we get, you know, 31,000 people missing, but only 9,000 of them recorded, um, which is ridiculous. So uh, I, I agree that these, this kind of information, the visual information, the audio information is important, not only for um, keeping a hold of history, but to solidifying what these stories mean and where we can trace back how they mean. Because uh, apart from um, you know a first person account of that, that's how we can track transgenerational transgenerational trauma. Is uh, how we've seen not only these stories progress, but how the technology has progressed as well. See what you're talking about is justice, and what Ben and I are talking about is capitalism. So the the comment is yeah. justice versus capitalism. Yeah. True yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I mean, I, I just, just so I can kind of just responding a little bit to the hiding images is depressing. 
um, or hiding metrics is problematic. Totally, of course. Like, I mean this on purpose. Like, that it's it's one suggestion of a strategy to even start to think about what the problems are behind the proliferation of quantification as authority um, and the use uh, and, and proliferation of image in, in these problematic ways. So um, I don't want an imageless world. I don't want to be behind a curtain. I, I don't want to not count things that need to be counted, but we also have an extreme reliance on these things um, and they get misused in, in all kinds of ways. And so that's why I, I make the suggestion. Right, and I feel like ultimately the real problem lies in who gets to make the decisions about what is seen versus not seen, whose story we're telling versus not, which is sort of what you were saying, mm -hmm. is this idea, and I see it so much in your work, sort of juxtaposed with yours, it's like, how much do the people who are being filmed get to say, this is what I want out there, which in the case of dead black men, they have no say because they're dead. Mm -hmm. But in the case of people, you know, in Palestine and Israel who are saying, oh, I'm showing this because I'm fighting back, they, how much agency do they have? And so I feel like, you know, from the standpoint of Facebook saying, oh, we're going to blank out these images, of course they have so much more agency to do that. Whereas the people, the black people who are scrolling through their feet every day and being like, if I see this video of this black man on the pavement one more time, I might die myself. We have no agency in that. I can't get on Facebook without seeing another person dead. And of course, you know, I'm tired of it, just like you are. And so I think ultimately the question lies in what, how do we get that agency? What's it going to take? And I don't feel like we can really answer that question right now. But I see sort of that's the common theme or like the tension that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also have just a comment based on the conversation is like, and maybe that buffer or quote unquote solution of hiding images isn't for everyone, right? Like not everyone acts visually the same way or the way that you see, you know, an image would probably not be the same. That solution is probably not for you, right? You know, it's... It's not a solution. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's not a solution. No, no, but I just, I mean, I think, you know, like, I'm definitely not trying to. No, I know. Yeah. It's, 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 um, it's our work. And in that sense, it's, it's maybe in opposition to a solution. It's, it's proposed. <laughs> yeah. If a regime has the power to disappear tens of thousands of people, we could never really expect them to be keeping meticulous records of that for us to see live as it's happening, right? So it just seems like a chicken and egg problem. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. The the comment, maybe question, was if a regime has the capacity to erase tens and thousands of stories, they're that already there. They're already there. Yeah, um, that's totally true. But uh, that's the that's what I'm dedicating my life to, essentially. <laughs> um, no, it's it's the, it is that, but it's also combining this work of. Um, talking to the people before they turn the camera on or before they get into those interrogation rooms, right? And seeing what the follow-up is until that has to happen because at that point that becomes evidence. And usually what happens that is, uh, what happens after that is fairly unpleasant things. And uh, it's about the... I don't want to use the, the visual or the audio as like a premonition type of thing, but it's definitely an interesting dynamic that we can use in predicting what our future can look like and using this information to um, educate and change future regimes is essentially what we're trying to do and how we use this technology to tell future stories or change the way that this kind of communication um, or information is spread across as we're doing literally right now. Um, there's, again, it's just a, uh, interesting fundamental tension between the state and between Silicon Valley. Like, with the state as the way it is, I think a lot of people, like, make uh, compromises with, you know, they're going to go to Airbnb anyway, they knowing that it's racist, or use Facebook anyway because they have to. And I'm wondering, like, who do we hold accountable for this when a lot of people are, like, picking sides? Should the state still be regulating Silicon Valley? And we'd be putting faith in a state that's in disarray, or you know, do we hold Silicon Valley accountable, and are they just gonna do some kind of weird PR move out of it? Like, who? I don't know. Um, I think there's a huge benefit to having uh, state regulations of um, startups like Airbnb. I mean, like, I, I don't know if I mentioned this in my talk, but like, Airbnb recently, um, they they. You know, there were there was a uh, a bill in New York City that would have um, 
uh, or that d does make it illegal to advertise short-term rentals uh, on Airbnb. And Airbnb like kept saying like, no, no, we're not driving up. You know, we're not um, adding to the affordability crisis. We're not, we're not, we're not. And then like the day before the bill was going to become a law, they're like, oh, uh, we're going to make this concession and we're going to, you know, donate like X millions of dollars to um, uh, New York City's affordable housing fund. And it was like, that was sort of like a tacit admission that they did have to like work with the regulatory state and that they were um, that there were problems, and and the tension came on, on both sides. I mean, there was there was like, um, the Hotel Trades Commission was like pressuring um, the city council, um, and also uh, activists were pushing against Airbnb. So there was like a lot of tension uh, on a lot of sides that led to that um, sort of concession. But yeah, I think that you know you you have to like regulate. Uh, these industries that are essentially like usurping um, the role of like you know public works. Like if if they're gonna usurp the role of public works, it should be regulated uh, the way public works was regulated. And and there are you know there's often like decades of laws that were put in place to regulate those public works, and they should be you know followed. Okay, can we give them another round of applause?